going to move this back just a little bit. I heard a comedian say the other day that her dad was a preacher and uh, he was a, a spitter so that the church took up a contribution one year to get those little foam things on the end of the microphone so that they could soak up some of the moisture as he, uh, as he spit it out. So y'all don't want to be in the spitting section. Uh, it's good to see everybody tonight. I know it's cold and wet, nasty outside. We're glad that you're able to be here and uh, glad that you're part of our assembly tonight. Lots of things coming up over the next couple of weeks. I know with the holiday schedule, so uh, make sure that you're uh, aware. We do want to remind you over the next two Sundays, we're going to have our, um, our afternoon service early in the afternoon uh, versus having it at six in the evening. So it'll be a a um, 1.30 afternoon service on both the 24th and the 31st. Uh, if for some reason you do need to come at 6 o'clock, we'll have a devotional here at the building. Uh, the Lord's Supper will be served. So that's going on the next two Sundays. Um, so make sure that you make a note of that. Uh, go ahead and open your Bibles, if you would, to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. We're going to resume a study that started a few weeks ago and some things came up and prohibited us from getting to those. But uh, in the spirit of Christmas, I do want to share another um, story with you about Christmas shopping. I know a lot of you are going to be doing that this week. Uh, there was a, a gentleman that went on a business trip and came back uh, just a couple of days before Christmas, and he had neglected to buy his wife a present. Um, guys, I don't recommend that. Uh, you need to make sure, if you haven't done so already, that you get your wife something nice. But <clears throat> he went to the department store, and he asked the lady at the cosmetics counter, uh, what he could buy his wife for Christmas. So he bought, uh, or the lady at the cosmetics counter brought a $50 bottle of uh, perfume. For those of you that have shopped for perfume lately, you know that's not a bad price to begin with. But he looked and he said, you know, that's a, that's a little expensive. I'm looking for something maybe not as high price. So she went back and bought a, a, a smaller bottle of perfume that was $30. And he said, no, I don't think you're understanding. I want something that's just not going to be, you know, all that expensive. So she went and she brought back this little bitty bottle of perfume. She said, this is only $15. He said, you know what? I don't think you're understanding me. I, I want you to show me something cheap. So she went behind the counter and she got the mirror and turned it around and showed it to him. <laughs> so be careful during the holidays. First Peter chapter 1 is where we're going to begin. And, and we, we left off um, several weeks ago talking about this idea of, of genuine faith, right? And this idea that, uh, that our faith is going to be tested, that has to be purified, has to go through a refining process. And when that happens, we'll be stronger. And we talked about, um, starting in verse 3, we talked about God's mercy. And we talked about a living hope through the resurrection. And the fact that we have an inheritance that can never be taken away or destroyed. And that we are kept by God's power through our faith. We talked about, um, starting in verse 7 of 1 Peter chapter 1, that genuine faith is valuable. Um, and that it's of the utmost value once we have it. That genuine faith, also in verse 7, will be tested we talked about in uh, continuing that same passage that a genuine faith is honest, that it removes all pretense and helps us to avoid being fake. In continuing, it, we're told that genuine faith is seen. It's not just something that's talked about, but it's lived. And that genuine faith is also within us. That, that if we want to have that authentic faith, it has to reside uh, within us. And so we're going to pick up um, in the... Verses immediately preceding the topic for tonight, starting in verse um, 10. I've shared with you before that verses 3 through um, 9 are, are one sentence in the original text. And then uh, verse 10 starts off a, a new sort of phrasing. And, and we touched on this very briefly um, in, our, in our Bible class a few weeks ago. But starting in verse 10, it says, of this salvation, the salvation that you and I have, this genuine faith, right, that leads to salvation, that's going to be tested. The prophets have inquired and searched carefully who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. So you've got these prophets prophesying, um, Isaiah, in Isaiah 53, prophesying about the Lamb of God that that would come and, and, and how it would be slaughtered. And, and you've got the psalmist in Psalm 22 writing about this, 
um, crucifixion. And, and so you've got Daniel in Daniel chapter 2 talking about a, a kingdom that was coming that could never be destroyed. And, and they, they inquired and wanted to know what this was that God was revealing through them. Then verse 12, to them it was revealed that not to themselves, but to us, they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Things which angels desire to look into. I've shared with you before that we are an extremely blessed people living in, in, a, in, a, in an amazing time in this world. That we are living in the last days that God has sent his son and we are the ones that have salvation through his blood. Not, not those people of old yet. Jesus' blood washes their sins. But we are the ones who have this unique relationship. We're the ones that have the completed word of God. We're the ones who have th this great blessing and advantage. And, and we have the clearest communication with God. And I know that sounds ironic because you read about people like Moses and Abraham who had direct communication with God. But we have the, God's completed word right here available at all times and that's an amazing blessing that I think we take for granted from time to time and so we've talked about genuine faith we've talked about how this salvation is a blessing how it's been sent uh, through the prophets and that even angels are looking down and, and and people might think that I'm reading too much into this but I think through this I think the angels are a little envious of what we have if an angel sins he doesn't have the blood of Christ to wash away his sins but you and I do and angels look down and see how favored we are with God so we've got a lot of theology in the beginning of this chapter. And then in verse 13, there's a word there. And in the New King James, it's therefore. I've called this lesson tonight, therefore. Whenever you see that, and, and we've made the joke that when you see that, you, you try to figure out what it's there for, right? That it's referring to the previous passages. And that says, because of this, you should do this. To me... The rest of this, 13 through the rest of the chapter, is the nuts and bolts of what we should do in response to the fact that we have this great blessing. In response to our salvation, in response to the fact that God has sent Jesus to, to wash our sins away, in response to that, this is how we should be living. So verses 13 and following, and I don't know if we'll get all the way through the end of the chapter tonight. To me, this, this, is, the, this is the practicality. This is the application of the theological statements that have preceded it. And so we're just going to kind of go through and, and think about some of these things together. Starting in verse 13, this is going to be a very textual study. We'll, we'll stay within here and see what we can find out. It says, therefore, and that's our key word, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, be sober. And there's an interesting trend there. If you want to leave a marker, we're going to stay in first Peter and look at a couple more passages. Turn over to chapter 4 of First Peter. First Peter chapter 4, verse 7. But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. Many translations translate that sober as well. Then one more chapter over, chapter 5, verse 8. This is a passage that we should know very well. Be, there's our word again, sober, be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, you don't have to turn there, I'll, I'll read it to you, but 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 6, therefore let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. I think that there's a, a very strict principle being applied here that we need to be aware, that we need to be ready, we need to be watchful for the things that are going on in our lives. I always equate this to, uh, to police officers or, or, or soldiers even if you want to apply that. Um, guys that have served in the military or, or Kenny Wiggins over there, probably not going to be able to sneak up on them anytime soon. Because they've been through training to be aware and, and, and to be watchful. I guarantee you if I went around to one of our career military guys or Kenny or some of you may have been through this kind of training and, and, and I was to, to ask them, you know, what, what is Lloyd Farrell wearing? Well, if, if, if 10 minutes from now somebody asked me, I might say, well, he was wearing a coat and tie. But I guarantee you these guys would be able to say, well, he's wearing a blue shirt and a red Christmas tie and a blue coat with a little American flag 
lapel pin. And he's got hair. It's not really gray, not really white. It's kind of that really distinguished color that's right in between them somewhere. Because th those people notice those kind of details. Those people notice the things that are in their peripheral vision. They're constantly aware of their surroundings. And maybe some of us just sort of walk down not thinking about the potential dangers that are out there. I think this is the principle that's being applied here is that we need to be aware, not aware of those people that can come and attack us in an alley in the dark, but be aware of our spiritual condition because we never know when the Lord will return. And, and, I, and I think that it's so obvious that a lot of times as Christians, we're just sleepwalking through life, not thinking about the consequences of the way that we live. So Peter reminds us, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, be aware, be awake. Continuing, and rest your hope, so what is my hope resting on? Fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. People have struggled with that wording. Well, Jesus has already been revealed. We know who he is. The mystery has been given to us. Jesus' life as the atoning sacrifice for, for our sins. But I think here it's talking about that ultimate revelation. That final revelation when Jesus returns. So he says that you've got to be aware and you've got to be looking earnestly, constantly waiting on the return of Jesus Christ. Yeah, he's already been revealed, but when he's revealed for that final time, that's what we need to be resting on. And that's where our hope needs to lie. So we need to be awake. We need to be resting our hope on the return of Christ. What else? He's going to add to that. So we need to be waiting for Jesus' return. How, in verse 14, he's going to elaborate. As obedient children. As obedient children. I want to ask you to leave a marker there and turn over to Ephesians chapter 6 with me. And this may seem like sort of a bizarre transition for what we're talking about, but I think there's a, an interesting principle that applies here. Ephesians chapter 6, starting in verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. I don't know about you, but my parents quoted that to me a lot, especially the part about if you want to live a long time on the earth, <laughs> you better do what I say, right? <laughs> uh, so, you know, we've heard that our whole lives. I think sometimes that we have this misunderstanding about this passage of Scripture, though, that we think we need to honor our parents when we are only children. I believe that this principle is teaching that as long as we're alive, we're to honor and respect our parents. I don't think there's ever an expiration date on that. Sometimes as we get to be teenagers, looking at some of these folks around here, um, remember that time when you learned that you knew a lot more than your parents? And then you got a little bit older and realized you didn't know anything at all. But even when we do get older and our, our parents maybe um, get a little bit old and senile and we, and we think that we don't have to respect them anymore. I believe this biblical principle applies that we need to be respectful to our parents. We need to be obedient to the things that, that they say. And we're, and we're to practice that same obedience to God. Like, we're, we're supposed to obey God the same way as obedient children. Now, I don't know about you, but I was, I was a question asker when I was growing up. Maybe, maybe some of you were as well. My favorite word was the word, why? Don't go out in the street. Well, why? Don't do this. Well, why? And, and I always wanted an explanation. Maybe that's just part of having an inquisitive mind, but I can imagine how annoying it was. And the answer, some of the time to that, was the same answer that you got, because what? I said so. And I didn't like that answer, but you know what? That answer is sufficient. Because sometimes there are things that are too complex to explain to a, a small child. And I think the same is true with God, that God could explain us his reasoning for everything that he did, but we wouldn't be able to even comprehend or understand a bit of what he was saying. So sometimes God says, I need you to do this, as obedient children, because I tell you to do it. And I think that if we obey God with exactness and with precision, that the same thing is true, that if we want our life to be well, 
It, we obey our parents. If we want our spirituality, our spiritual lives, to, to, if we want our spiritual condition to be strong, we'll obey God as obedient children do. Continuing, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts as in your ignorance. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 says, Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We don't need to be conformed. Verses 15 and 16 go together here. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. That's a quotation from the 11th chapter of the book of Leviticus. So we're told by God to be holy because he is holy. And 2 Corinthians chapter 7 sort of, sort of deals with this. And, and I guess we need to get into the context a little bit. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 is uh, one of the areas where Paul is writing concerning how he scolded them in 1 Corinthians. Specifically, in my opinion, he's talking about uh, when he wrote about the man who was living in a, in a sexually immoral situation. And in chapter 7, he's going to write to them about the fact that he's glad that he wrote that letter and, and forced them to change. But listen to what he says in the outset of that in 2 Corinthians 7, 1. Therefore, having these promises... Talking about these promises of salvation, the promises that we stand on. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So he talks about holiness and fear together. Now let's go back to our 1 Peter chapter 1. You know, if you ever doubt the inspiration of Scripture, just go read how two men who were very completely different people in Peter and Paul. One grew up very educated, right? One grew up at the feet of Gamaliel. One grew up going to all the finest schools and learning classical language and philosophy. And one grew up on a boat catching fish with a net. But Paul, in that context, wrote about living with holiness in the fear of God. Not the fear as I'm scared to death, but in the fear that I have awe and reverence and respect. And let's see what Peter said. So because it is written in verse 16, be holy for I am holy. In verse 17, and if you call on the Father who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time here of your stay, or throughout the time of your stay here in, what's the word? Fear. So according to both Peter and Paul, Holiness, the reason that we live a holy lifestyle is associated with the fear of God. Respect and awe and, and reverence for who he is. And I'm going to tell you, if there's a topic that we could never preach enough on as long as we lived, it's having respect and fear and awe and reverence for who God is. We don't have that respect because if we did, we'd be living a lot more holy lifestyles. But verse 17, I don't know if that jumps out to you, but it does to me. I even have it circled here in, in my text. If you call on the Father who without partiality. Now that sounds familiar to us, doesn't it? In Acts chapter 10, verses 34 and 35, that God is not a respecter of persons. That he judges with no partiality whatsoever. But that he does indeed judge Hebrews 9, 27 and 28. It is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. So how will he judge? Many religious teachers would explain it to you this way. That on the day of judgment, God will look at a person and say, you know what? Um, at the age of seven years old at a tent revival... You were saved and recited a prayer or, or responded to some altar call. And, and no matter what you do for the rest of your life, that's all that's going to matter on the day of judgment. It's not going to matter how you lived or, or what you did or, or what language you used or, or, or if you ever went to church. None of that stuff will ever matter when you stand before God on judgment day. And I want to tell you, there'll be, there'll be so many people that are lost based on that false teaching. But what, is, what does the scripture actually say about judgment? So yeah, God does judge without partiality. But he judges according to each one's work. 
we're judged according to the way that we live. I guarantee you a, a religious teacher watching this right now might say, well, preacher, you're taking that out of context. That's just one obscure verse. It doesn't say what you think it says. Well, let's see if we can find it somewhere else. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, maybe. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I want you to highlight this in your Bible if you don't have it already. Starting in um, John Johnson's not here. This is one of this is probably my favorite chapter of the Bible. He says I say that about a bunch of different ones, but this probably is. But starting in verse ten of Second Corinthians chapter five, let's actually start in verse nine. Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well pleasing to Him, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. We just read that, right? That each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done whether good or bad knowing therefore the terror of the Lord we persuade men but we are well known to God and I also trust are well known in your consciences what about Ecclesiastes chapter 12 verse 13 we know that very well right we know let us hear the conclusion of the of the matter fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man but you know what verse 14 says that we're going to be judged according to the things that we've done. And there are other passages that say that as well. So this idea of, of once saved, always saved, or well, whatever, whatever we want to refer to it as, this idea that, that we're not going to be judged based on the things that we've done, but that God's grace and mercy is so bountiful that he'll just look at us and immediately forgive everything that we've done, it's just not true. We're judged based on the stewardship of the things that we've been given, whether or not we took advantage of the blessings and the salvation that we were given or whether we wasted it. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, Ephesians 2.10. Verse 18, we're still in the, in the middle of a thought here. This is still one sentence. Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct, received by tradition from your fathers. He's kind of doubling down on this bad conduct, right? He's saying that you shouldn't conform to everybody around you. You shouldn't be like everybody else in your past. You've got to be different because you weren't redeemed with things like gold or silver. You were redeemed with what then? In verse 19, you were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. We won't rehash our whole discussion this morning, but man, we spent a lot of time talking about Jesus as our sacrifice. Isaiah 53 says he was led as a lamb to slaughter. John chapter 1, verse 29, behold the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. We sing a song sometimes called Lamb of God. It's not, not my favorite song, as it sounds like... Um, you threw a bunch of gravel in a car engine and turned it on. And I hate the way it sounds, but the words are really beautiful. Lamb of God, that we were redeemed with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, who was a perfect and, and sinless sacrifice. Verse 20, is he indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world. We're we'll harking back to our discussion this morning. You remember when we said that, that Jesus was alive and the plan for our salvation happened before the foundation of the world? Paul wrote to the Ephesian church about that as well. We read about it in Colossians chapter 1, 15 through 18. We read about it um, in John chapter 1 that, that he was foreordained. He was predestined to, be, to come and be the sacrifice for our sins. He was foreordained before the foundation of the world. But was manifest in these last times for you. Or in the way we said it this morning from Galatians 4, 4 through 5, wasn't about the last times, but it was about the fullness of time. He was manifest in the fullness of time and exactly the right circumstance and situation for us. I know we'll run out of time. We'll try to speed this up just a little bit. Verse 21, who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope 
or in God. I think that's pretty important to establish the relationship between us and God. I want you to sort of think about it, and, and I should have popped this up on the screen. Um, John Painter's done a really good job of illustrating this, some of his Lord's Supper devotionals. It's like um, two cliffs with a big ravine in the middle. And there's a bridge across it. And on one side is us, and on one side is God. And as long as we lived a perfect life, and we were innocent, and we were children, we were, that bridge was intact. But as soon as we sinned, that bridge came crumbling down and there was separation between us and God. And we needed some way to repair that relationship. We needed some way to get back to God. We needed some way to have that fractured relationship repaired. The only way, I want you to hear this from me now, the only way that that relationship can be repaired is through Jesus. The only way. That's why we hear, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's the only way for that relationship to be fixed. Verse 22, since you've purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. We said this is the, the nuts and bolts. This is the practical part, right? You ever heard anybody say, you know, I really love God, but I struggle with other people. Well, here's the thing. Part of loving God is learning to love other people. We have to love one another. Verse 23, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. Because all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is the flower of the grass. The grass withers, and its flower falls away. But the word of the Lord endures forever. The word of the Lord endures forever. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 8, tells us that very clearly. Matter of fact, that will be the concluding passage for our summer series this summer. Now, this is the word by which the gospel was preached to you. There's a lot more we can say about that, but for time's sake, we won't. But I love this, this introduction and, and uh, this discussion by Peter. Because he gives us the, the theology, right? He says, because of your salvation, it's going to be tested and you're going to go through things, but it's going to make it more valuable. It's going to make it stronger. And if you ever doubt how precious that salvation is, know that the prophets in times past and the angels look down and are envious of the things that, that you have. And he says, but if you want to take advantage of that, if you want to be blessed, if you want to have that and actually let it mean something to your life, this is the way you have to live. And maybe we don't balance those two things very well. Maybe our lives get out of balance and, and, and we, maybe we think too much... Um, or too abstractly, maybe we think too practically, but those things are combined together. We have to understand that we're not ever going to be saved just by how good we are and how we live our lives, because that's not enough. But we're also not going to be saved just because God loves us. He has an expectation on our lives to be obedient like children to his word and to live a Christian life. And I think sometimes we just lose that and, and we, we get out of balance with it. And we, we forget that there's a very high standard of living for us if we're going to wear the name Christian. So think about our lives tonight. And we, I've, I've often wondered, what is it, what's the magic potion that you can say during the invitation that will touch people's hearts? And the truth is, is this. Nothing that Chase or Butch or myself says is ever going to touch anybody's heart to make them respond. The piercing of the heart comes from God's Word. And if Peter said something tonight that touched your heart and you want to change your life, if you're a Christian, you can come down and we'll pray with you and pray for you and try to help strengthen you in any way that we can. If you're not a Christian tonight, know that the perfect, spotless, 
pure Lamb of God was sacrificed so that you could have salvation. And you contact, contact the blood of that perfect Lamb through baptism. You can change your life tonight, confess that Jesus is God's Son, and be baptized so that your sins will be washed away by that blood. And if you stand in need of that, we would love for you to make that decision tonight. Whatever your need is, come as we stand and as we sing.